Hey everyone, my name is Nathan Pay, and welcome to another episode of Blue Ocean Crypto. Today we're going to be covering part two of our deep dive into Avalon the Druid's light paper. So if you guys haven't seen that first video, definitely check it out because we're just continuing on. There's just so much awesome information jam-packed into this MMO Web3 game. And I've mentioned it many times before, I think this game has some of the highest potential in the entire space right now. So we've got a lot of ground to cover, let's jump right into it. So if you remember, we did temples and villages last, now we're covering castles and kingdoms. So they do talk about how it's gonna be custom designed and tailored to the needs and requirements of its owner. Now what's really interesting about this, there's specific bonuses, protector dragons, and many other advantages. The aesthetic details and custom music will match the NFT and its location. So this is gonna be a huge feature in the game, a huge focus, I guess you could say. So there's a main castle with gardens and a fountain of life. We know fountain of life is a place that you can go to and get a temporary buff. That's really important. The city's protected with secondary wall system and closed inside the castle defenses. A VR interior, that's gonna be really cool, for main meeting chambers and throne room. The protector dragon NFT that can be tamed by the castle owners. I mean, yes, please. Set of NPC guards defending gates, tax collection mechanism. I'm really interested in the tax collection mechanism and how that's gonna work and how customizable it's gonna be based on when you own it. And then of course, land assignment. Now, moving on to harbors. This is gonna be a really important aspect of the game as well. And I actually really like that quote by John A. Shedd as well. So it's interesting because they talk about how the large harbors are reserved for locations near the castle. Um, and medium harbors are basically at the edges of the island of Mole, strategically positioned in proximity to vi villages and towns guarding raid gates. So there's going to be value in both of them, right? The large har harbors are going to be close to the castle, so obviously it's going to be easier to get around or go on ships, you know, if you're constantly meeting at your castle. But there's going to be a lot of activity, um, you know, on the edges because people are going to be doing raids and maybe they're going to need to be repairing and doing other trade there. So they're both going to be valuable. Uh, they talk about how the deed grant ownership of the har one harbor master building, building as well as deeds to 30 land lots in its vicinity that can be leased out to other players to build on. So houses, storages, etc. As such, the harbor NFT owner can collect tax from the leases as a form of income. So once again, tax mechanism. Really cool when we were talking about the castles with that. Uh, manufacturing buildings pay a 4 to 5.5% transaction fee if houses or homes pay a small monthly lease in AVL to the harbor master. I think this is gonna be a huge way to generate income, personally. I think getting a harbor is gonna be a real key asset in this game when we get to there. They also talk about how you get a custom designed four story building viewable in VR. I think the VR stuff is just gonna be awesome. But I like this, I like how they laid out the perks, right? Passive own to earn style of NFT, the tax mechanism four to 5.5%. Uh, harbor master building, the fish market, shipyard, harbor mill, portal, forge, four medium and eight large ship docks, depending on the size of the harbor, harbor storage, which is 48 storage buildings, and then 15 to 30 dwelling unit units, which are homes owned by ship owners, fleet owners, guilds, and merchants. I mean, this is going to be a massive uh, thing to own. It's going to be really important in the game. Probably one of the more expensive things too, just like the castles. Moving along to housing. We've got huts, homes, and farms, and it's important to understand the distinction between these. So, all habitats will include the following, and here's actually a good example of a small village home. Um, we actually have a few of them right now. So, you get a storage chest, super important uh, for people who are familiar with a lot of other MMOs in this space. Inventory space is always an issue. Uh, getting a storage chest really uh, makes a big difference. And you can see the storage space actually differs based on the size of your home, right? So hut starts at 30 all the way up to a large home and farmhouse is 120. There are also some resources that you will be able to pick up on a bit of a respawn timer whenever you go into the home. So for example, if you have a farmhouse, you're going to be able to go and pick up some wood, metal ore, some barley, a mushroom and pumpkin. And you'll be able to constantly grab these when you go back to your home. Pretty cool little addition there. Uh, they also talk about how mansions also offer a meeting room for small guild or team gathering especially entertaining when viewed through VR. I like how they keep mentioning the VR thing. I think that's going to be really beautiful. One thing we've noticed, we're playing in the early alpha right now. I actually really enjoy just exploring and enjoying the stunning views and the environment. And that's rare for me to say. Usually in an MMO, I'm very strategic. I need to be grinding. I need to be doing this or I'm wasting my time. I have to be super efficient. I've actually really enjoyed 
just going fishing or to the harbor or exploring new places. Avalon's really opened that up for me like a game that really hasn't ever before. Uh, they also talk about how the home doors can only be opened by its owners and you can actually grant access to the home uh, by adding different people in so you can kind of say who's allowed, who's not. Uh, you can't store NFTs in your home, but you can store any other inventory items, including heavy weapons and armor. You can claim your dwelling by approaching an unclaimed host structure and binding it to your to your hut and home's NFT. Basically, what they're saying is when you run up to a home, it might say for sale. And you can literally just, while you're in game, bind your home to that. Boom. Now you have that property, which is pretty awesome. Uh, they're also the most affordable buildings in Avalon's NFT collections. So generally, this is a good entry point for people. It helps get you a home makes you feel attached to you know where you're at, get accustomed to your area. Maybe you want to be very strategic where you get your home, but then you get the storage, which obviously opens up a lot. Now, I am super pumped about farms because I love farming simulators and farming games, and this is what the farm is going to add, right? So now all farm animals can be tamed, opening up opportunities for breeding and creating a thriving ecosystem. And I like their example. Picture this, chicken eggs that can be used as nourishing food for or tantalizing cooking recipes and pigs that produce abundant quantities of raw meat. So there's going to be hens, roosters, chicks, pigs, swines, and piglets. And they're all going to have different utility and different advantages to having them. So I'm really excited for this. I feel like once this is in the game and we can actually do it, I'm going to be spending quite a bit of time on the farming and the breeding and all of that aspects. I just really love it. So moving along, talking about businesses. I do want to slow down a little bit here because this is really important, especially for people who are looking to get into the game. Where do you start, right? I think a home is a great place to start. Gives you the extra storage. Now you've got forges, mills, portals, and stables. Forges, arguably one of the most important, I would say, because everyone needs to repair their weapons. Something that we've learned in the early alpha, this is probably the best money maker right now. So, you know, there's selling. So the Forge NFTD grants ownership to a Forge building with material storages and an optional two-story VR interior. Each Ford also includes a built-in store that allows direct sales of minted items to the village, i.e. gear. Repairing, this is where it's the biggest money maker right now. There's durability that you lose on your weapons. You have to go back and repair constantly. Going to a Forge does that, right? Now, if you own your own Forge, you're obviously going to go back there every single time so this is really good for guilds and people that have groups that can actually you know assist and say hey yeah we're all going to support your forge this is also definitely a more expensive asset to own but like i said probably one of the best money makers right now that could very much change they also talk about how forge owners will receive eight nft characters who can be rented to other players in the form of a scholarship additional additionally for forge owners use unique tools and resources gathered through completion of quests to craft and subsequently sell rare and valuable nfts on the different marketplaces. And you can see here, Forge owners have a 40% chance to receive a wearable NFT item with a maximum of 12 items per month. That's like a, cons that's amazing. Just owning a Forge, you're gonna get all of these assets. There's Cyper Bow, uh, Standard Bow, Vikings Protector Axe, Sword and Shield, Elven Dew Swords, and Dark Mage Fire Staff. And we can even see here what the repair cost in AVL is. Uh, Here's another picture of the Harbor Forge. Harbor Forge is a little bit different than the regular Forge right now. And because it has to, there is some stuff where it's gonna be a little special with ship materials and ship crafting and stuff like that. But we don't have a ton of details on that yet. There is some, uh, but it is good to know that the Harbor Forge is a little different than our regular Forge. So windmills, we own one of these. This is where you make food, right? So it's one of the key structures in the, in the kingdom to provide health recovery goods and essential quest items as well as on-demand services such as flower production. Bills generate income for their owners as well as provide support to community food banks. Here's a great example. Right now you can make bread, berry bread, honey bread, apple pie. There's different cost for it, obviously. You know, so when you are... There's different cost for it, obviously. So bread is the cheapest. You know, it only costs two AVAL and five grain. You go all the way up to apple pie, which is 15 AVAL, fine grain, five grain, three honey, three, three apples. But obviously you can tell the benefit scales with it as well. So everybody needs this. Everybody needs bread to survive. It's the consumable, basically that heals you. Yes, there's druids that heal, but everyone needs bread. If they want to solo and just as an emergency. So mills always get used. And mills are often always, actually not often, they always are surrounded by like areas where you can collect wheat. 
So generally when you see a mill, you can just run around, collect the wheat, go in there and make the bread that you need. They do talk about the passive income and convenience. Like I mentioned, high traffic areas, it's obviously going to be strategic where you put your mill. There's going to be more of a chance that people use it. Let's say it's next to a really popular raid gate. It's off in the middle of nowhere. Obviously, it's not going to get as much use. So maybe you're not going to get that income from random players. Great for guilds as well, because basically you just tell all your guildmates, hey, use this mill. Uh, they talk about storage and training. You can store extra manufactured goods in the food banks at a small fee, which is payable to food bank NFT owners. Stu the stored food can be later sold, traded, or exported to other villages or islands where there's scarcity of such materials. This is really cool because it's a second route of uh, revenue. They also talk about how you can upgrade your mill. So you can see level one, what you're able to get, required resources, level two, and level three. I think yarn and salt is going to be pretty important. That's not available in the early access right now. All we have is bread, berry bread, honey bread, and apple pies. So moving along to portals. Portals, super important. Everyone needs to travel, right? And you don't want to just be running on foot. I recommend actually that you do a little bit to explore. There are horses and stables. We'll get to that uh, next. But portals are really the shortcut. So when you own one of these, obviously you're going to be collecting revenue from every single person that uses it. Now, there's a couple important things about this, though. Uh, it's definitely the most important or popular way to travel across the world. But in order to gain access to portals, you need to complete the Druid Portal Quest 1 through 5 and attain at least level 10. So new players can't just jump in, use the portals right away. Uh, and you are required to recharge portals with Druid Ore, which is available at the Forge or via the Druid Tempo Quest. Not currently in the Early Access or the Alpha, but this will be in soon. Uh, also, once again, you can upgrade them, right? So, for example, a single destination portal such as a harbor village portal can be leveled up to a multi-destination one. So now I can go to multiple places, which is really neat. And there's a minimum transportation fee of 5 AVL. However, the portal owner may set higher prices at their own discretion or for competition and traffic. Obviously, if someone way too high, people are going to skip it. Maybe you got to find that sweet spot, right? And then it does kind of show an example here of, a you know, when you bring it up, kind of how it will, it's 50 AVAL, you're going to go to Attila Harbor, it shows what your currency is, gives you a little bit of description. And then this is kind of a cool little side note. Right underneath, if you guys notice this, it says discover the vampire caves. It's almost kind of telling you about like a little secret or something that you should do in that area. I really like that touch. Now, staples. These are fun. Staples, obviously, you guys get it, has to do with horses. You know, there's going to be able, you're going to be able to breed and crossbreed them. Uh, it's going to be introduced later on in the game. Uh, it gives you the ability to tame wild horses, upgrade them, and sell them to citizens. There's lots of different types of horses, and they have different perks. So you can see here, Attila has the precious ability to heal its owner in case of in in injury. Basically, you get on the horse, it heals you. That's really sweet. There's ones that are even really fast. Moving on to NFT characters. So... You're going to need these to gain access to the beta. Now, it's interesting because what are all these characters? And this is where some people can get tripped up. So first, it shows main characters. We've got the Grand Inquisitor, the Templar Grand Master, and the Knight of the Round Table. When you take a look at the, Equ and the Inquisitor, there's a couple key things. Take a look at the uh, rarity up here, though. There's Epic, Legendary, and then Mythical. Mythical is obviously the most rare. There's very few of them whatsoever. One thing that is the same is the abilities. Tame dragons, grow dragons, ride dragons, that's the same almost across the board. You can see epic, you do have a minimum level 50. Legendary, that goes away. And then mythical, you're really just getting rid of that level requirement. There also is a raid bonus. You can see 25%, 10% play to earn bonus, bo six bonus skills. Six, per like it scales down quite a bit actually from 10 to six. Uh, in 25 to 15 also four bonus skills and then epic same thing i think the way that they scaled this is really well a little bit more information down here that kind of maps it out properly on the differences and then moving on to the templar grandmaster this is currently my favorite class right now although i do want to be playing the knights of the round table i want to be more of a tank he's kind of more of a hybrid mage i guess you could say so special abilities enlightenment path of osiris same thing, you're going to notice when we go over to Legendary and Mythical, the Mythical simply gets rid of it, but there is a special ability that's different on Legendary and Mythical. Here we have Path of Raven, and here we have Path of Sekhmet. So same kind of similar breakdown, you know, with the skill bonuses, play to earn bonus, and raid bonus. 
Obviously, if you guys are super serious about this, Mythic's the way to go, but they are definitely the most expensive characters, that's for sure. Um, let's just scroll down a little bit more. Here it kind of shows you an example of the Mythical. I mean, I love this guy. I'm probably going to have a Mythical myself, uh, but I am also interested in playing the main um, as a tank, so the Knight of the Round Table, I'm also very interested in. But hey, there's nothing saying I can't play more than one character, right? So moving on to the Knight of the Round Table. Now, this guy is super cool because he can actually change into a werewolf. Now, same thing. We take a look at, you know, the difference. There's only epic and legendary of these, though, right? There is that. We don't see anything mythic here. So there is some talk about how they were in the mythical chests or something's going on there. But right now, obviously, officially, we can only see the epic and legendary. And then talks about how, you know, you can shapeshift for 120 seconds, uh, you know, between legendary only 60 for epic. Then there's special characters, which are the forge workers. Now, forge workers, you know, we talked about this covering the forge, how you get a bunch of them. They can participate, they cannot participate in quests, level up, or be sold. Really, their functioning game is to gather resources and deliver them to the forge's storage so that they can be used and transformed. It's like having workers that are going to go out and do stuff for you, right? So, moving on to the NFT wearables. These are the NFTs currently in the game. We've got the Werewolf Heart Medallion, the Titan's Helm, Explorer Boots. Carl's Carapace, we call it, and the Champion's Ring. So the Werewolf Heart, you know, specific bonus, you get 10% damage increase, 10% uh, reduction, or you do 10% more and you take 10% more, essentially. But there's some unique things, like right now we're hearing this is going to be taken out of the game and you're going to need it in order to get into the Werewolf City. So it's going to be a very limited edition NFT. That's potential too. It's not confirmed 100% yet. There's also the Titan Helm. The immunity to knockback and pull effects is massive in this game. This is one of the hardest things to grind, though. It takes a very long time. It also increases your health. Explorer boots are really cool. You have to find at least 12 different chests and all kinds of locations you have to visit in order to do that. And they increase your movement speed by 10% and provide protection against fall damage. Then we've got the carapace. This is awesome. I love this as a tank. Literally 50% damage reduction. Now, it does make you... 50% slower, but as a tank, obviously that's fine. Now, this is the hardest item to get. This is in raid three. You have to be really high level, at least 100 plus. You have to have a group, but it gives you the best stat boost out of any item in the game. There's actually not many people that even have this right now. I've never seen one for sale on the market. Really awesome. So just moving along, there's the chests. So these are really interesting. This is something that they did. There's rare, epic, legendary, and mythical. And I'll just kind of give you an example. One mythical character you can see here, uh, an early access pass to the beta. And it kind of gives you an example, you know, the chest gives you a character, but the character is random. And then of course you get access. Now talking about the economy, they talk about how you can collect sales tax by owning in-game land, finish quests or multiplayer raids to receive a or rare NFTs own manufacturing and hospitality buildings to trade goods and craft rare NFTs. These are kinds of like the main points or three ways that you can earn AVAL in the game. And then come, come down here, kind of breaks it out a little better. Own to earn income level, right? So you can see a village home. There's nothing that you're going to earn by doing that, but we know you get storages. Mill, right? Income level is three. It's passive and automated. It pays the tax. Same with the portals. They go a little higher. Then you get up to the temple town hall harbor and castle is the highest so something to keep in mind too when you're looking at purchasing assets is what the earning capabilities are there's also free to play scholarships this is pretty cool so this is going to be something that i'm looking forward to when they get into the game but in the early stages of avalon there will be no free to play option so right now you do better buy a pass but you can collect nfts it's totally worth every dollar i would highly recommend you guys do it if you haven't get involved in this game yet it is a ton of fun but it's really cool that they're going to be adding this in. Taking a look at the roadmap, we kind of see here everything that they've accomplished so far. Getting into 2023, there's still a lot that they have to do. And I mean, guys, this is an MMO. The, the development timeline on this is long. But I'm impressed at the rate that they're going for the size of their team. And I'm really excited to see what the future brings with for this game. So talking about the team a little bit, you know, kind of going into some of their staff. I I'm a Freddy Silva fan. I've been following his work for probably five or six, maybe even seven years now. So when I first learned that he was involved in this project, I was super pumped about that. A lot of other amazing people involved, obviously, in the project too, which is really cool. 
talk about some of their development advisors, supported blockchains. This is really unique, guys. Like, what other game have you seen that is planning to be on pretty much every single freaking chain? This is incredible, right? And they're, they're already on Polygon, Wax, Binance, Ethereum, and Immutable X. Like, what? Um, now, with the Ethereum, though, uh, that's where you can go buy assets. It's not necessarily that you can connect your Ethereum wallet. So that's kind of one small difference there. And you can see here, there is some small variance, but the fact that they've done this, they're really kind of leading the way in the industry right now for interoperability, I think. I mean, I can be on Wax. My friend can be on Polygon. We're both doing a raid. We both get a reward. That's pretty incredible. Talking about consoles and mobile, Xbox and Nintendo Switch. So, I mean... This is the thing, these guys are working on compliance, the way that they have their system set up. These are one of the first projects that told me about their strategy on how to be able to, you know, scale to the masses. And there's only one other project that I know of, Heroes of Mavia, that's been able to do something similar, but in the mobile aspect. So this is a big reason why I've got my eye so close on this game, why we're playing so much, because I think these guys are leading in the space when it comes to this. They also talk about Nintendo Switch. I mean, this is awesome to see. Uh, where to buy, Atomic Hub, OpenSea, Venly, so lots of options. I like using Wax myself. They talk about partnerships and guilds. They're always open to collaborations to reach out to them. They have an amazing customer support team, which we're going to talk about right here. Um, so you can always come to their Discord, reach out. And all the disclaimer stuff is kind of like a little bit of the boring stuff and the privacy policy, so I'll skip that. But once again, the early access is going on right now. There's a seven-day pass where you guys can just try it you know see if you like it but i would highly recommend you grab the 30 days so you can start collecting the nfts thanks so much for your time today i hope you guys have a much better understanding of this game come in our discord ask us questions about it we'd love to kind of show you around do some raids with you get you involved in this amazing project that's going to have some huge potential in the new near future and it's fun right now as always thank you so much for subscribing to the channel it really means a lot to us and I appreciate everyone who's liked this video as well. We'll catch you guys in the next video. Cheers.